Mercedes-Benz car for sale. Uh, Y'all can be seated for just a second. Uh, and it's sitting right outside here, uh, but now the car is a couple of little things with it. It has some issues, pretty major issues in fact. The car leaks pretty badly as far as oil goes. The one of the seats, the front seat, or the main seat in the front of the car, driver's seat needs to be changed and so forth. But somebody blessed our ministry with it because they know I'm a car dealer and we would normally take cars and liquidate the cars and take them through auctions get whatever monies we can out of it and put it towards our um, ministry uh, evangelism fund. But because the auctions are closed and have been closed for a while, um, due to the fact that that has occurred like that, we're just going to make it available for anyone that wants to buy a car for the low, low cost of $150. All right. Now, can you beat that with a stick anywhere? $150. It is drivable. It does drive. It has a diesel engine. But there are some issues, and one of the issues is that it does not have a title. But as a car dealer, because it's a 1984 car, you don't really need a title for a car that old. And so for 30 years old, so you don't really need the title. We have the paperwork. So if you did purchase the car for 150, and if you wanted to use it as a fixer upper and kind of put some things in it, get the oil leak fixed, put another seat from a junkyard somewhere in the front, you got yourself a nice running, pretty decently reliable car has extremely high miles. It has like 360 something thousand miles on it, but that's okay. You know, it's a diesel engine. They last forever if you keep up with it. Amen. So again, we're making it available for anyone that wants it for 150 bucks. And that money again goes toward the evangelism ministry here. If that be the case, if you're interested in it, you can just see me right after service. I'll show you the keys. You can look at it and take it for a spin around the parking lot if you like. And if there are issues where you cannot get the car registered for whatever reason, which there should not be any issues. Remember, I am a used car dealer. I know how this works. But if there are, for whatever reason, issues where you cannot get that car registered, we would gladly refund you the money. So that's just a, something to think about. It's sitting right outside here behind my car, kind of cat a corner a little bit. So if you're interested, just see me afterwards. Amen. Wanted to get that out of the way. Maybe that could be a blessing for somebody. In the meantime, why don't we all stand at this time? And I'm going to ask if you will, if you can point your hands in this direction as we pray for God's anointing to be upon us. Amen. Father, in Jesus' name, as we come to the, the, the most prime time, the, the most important portion of the service, Lord, the word of God. As I humble myself behind the sacred pulpit, Lord Jesus, as your servant, as your mouthpiece, Father, I pray that the anointing of the Holy Ghost will come upon me to speak your word, Jesus even as you've instructed me to speak it, Father. I pray that you would open up our spiritual ears and our understanding that the supernatural revelation of Jesus Christ will grab a hold of us, Lord, and let this word penetrate the very core being of our uh, soul and body and spirit, Father. Let this word resonate in our hearts even after we've left the service. Once the service ends, let the service begin, Lord Jesus. Let the power of the Holy Spirit and the word of God take us to new heights and new levels in you, Christ. 
Lord, I rebuke any type of hindrances, any type of uh, demonic attacks in any way, shape, or form during the preaching of the word of God. And I pray, Father, that you would drive out anything in our heart that is not like you, Jesus. Speak, Holy Spirit, we pray to our hearts right now as we are being shaped and formed into the very image and after the very likeness of our beloved Savior, Jesus the Christ. Father, we thank you for all of the results of your word as it's preached, Lord. And we pray without a doubt that you would confirm your preached word with signs following. Father, we're so careful to give all the glory, the thanks, the praise, and honor to you for everything you're doing in us, for us, and through us. We ask these blessings and prayers in Jesus' name. Amen. amen. Go ahead and take your seats, if you will, and turn in your Bibles to the book of Revelation, chapter 3. We're on a journey as we've been for the past two months. And this particular journey has taken us in new heights and in new levels. The Lord spoke to my heart in the beginning of this year and told me that he wanted me to minister on the seven churches of Asia or the seven churches of Revelation. We've been doing just that, ministering on the seven churches of Asia. And these churches, understand this, that when it comes to church history, these churches are relevant for us today. Let me have that other mic right quick, if you don't mind. Always technical difficulties here, and I, I, I apologize for that. Real quick. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Mic check. Mic check. Okay, great, great. So these churches are relevant to the churches today in our society. Understand, there are seven churches of Asia Minor. Seven churches. Now, John, the, one, the, the very disciple that walked with Christ, the one that Jesus called the beloved disciple, or shall I say, John called himself the beloved disciple. He actually walked with Jesus Christ where Jesus walked. And he was the only living disciple that was not martyred. Can you believe that? He was the only one that lived to be an old man. And he lived and, and wrote the book of Revelation right around AD 90. He was exiled as an old man on an island called Patmos, which was prox approximately 50 to 70 miles off the coast of Ephesus and another, well, 70 miles uh, past Corinth and 50 miles from the church of Ephesus on an island called Patmos. And while he was in the spirit, the Bible says, on the Lord's day, an angel came to visit him and told him to write these things down in a book because this would be the revelation of Jesus Christ. Notice it's not called revelations, but revelation. It's the revelation of Jesus. This is the book where Jesus reveals himself. It's a very intimate side of Christ. One of the gospels of the, of the Bible in, in the New Testament of the uh, epistles, or shall I say the synoptic gospels, what we have we have what we call four Gospels, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. And of the three, Matthew, Mark, and Luke, these are the ones to talk about Jesus and Jesus the Son of God, Jesus the Son of Man, you know, or, or, or shall I say Jesus, Jesus from a uh, historical uh, view of, of him being a Jew. So he's ministered to Jews in Matthew and in Mark, you know, gives you another side of Christ as he is the Son of you know, of man in Mark and then in, and in Luke, he's, you know, Luke, the physician gives another side of Jesus. But in John, he's the, the son of God. And John is the only gospel that does not talk about parables. If you've ever read John, you won't find Jesus using a parable anywhere in the book of John. Only Matthew, Mark and Luke, because John is that disciple that was the same one that wrote the book of Revelation. And he is in the spirit and he's ministering to these churches in Asia Minor, which is today modern Turkey. And God had a message for each individual church. We've talked about four of those churches thus far. We're on the fifth church. We talked about the letter to the church of Ephesus, the letter to the church of Smyrna. Then after that, he mentioned a letter to the church of Pergamum or Pergamus, and then the letter to the church of Thyatira. And today we're on the church of Sardis. So before I go any further, let me give you a little bit of the history of this particular church in Sardis. Just like Pergamum was a big, huge, uh, illustrious city that sat upon a big mountain that could be seen from miles away, so was Sardis. Sardis was a beautiful town, a beautiful city. It was actually the kingdom of Lydia back in the BC days. 
And it was an ancient capital. It was the capital of Lydia during the 7th century, located in western Anatolia, which is present-day providential uh, Turkey today. The king's most, uh, the, uh, the kingdom's uh, most noteworthy king was Croatia. He was a very wealthy king who ruled from about 560 to 400 and, uh, 547 B.C. And he was the first person to strike an issue with the true pure gold and silver coins used in the marketplace. So coins were first minted from gold and silver right there in the city of Sardis. Tiberia, who was an emperor during the time while Jesus Christ was growing up at 17 years old, uh, he was the emperor of Rome during that particular time, and he was an extremely evil, wicked man. And he is the one that built, uh, rebuilt the city of Sardis because Sardis was destroyed right during the time of Christ in AD 17. Now it was located, Sardis was located on the foot of a mountain this big, huge mountain in the background, and this mountain was called Tumolus, and it was 32 miles away from Pergamos, 27 miles away from the Church of Philadelphia, about 30 miles southeast from the Church of Thyatira, and about 45 miles south of Smyrna. Like, that means something to you. But at least we gave you the geography so you can see the close proximity of the churches. Now, the city of Sardis and its surrounding areas were watered by Patolus River, which was uh, a river that actually poured water right down the mountain to Molus, where it flowed throughout the city, and gold was found in the waters. Now, that was a legend, because I don't know if you've heard of Midas before. Midas was an actual king that lived. He was not a Greek god or, you know, Roman god. He was actually an actual king. But now, the legend may be a little made up somewhat, but then again, some people claim that it actually happened. Uh, several miles from that was, was where the kingdom of Midas was, who was an actual king. And Midas was the guy that came from a very poor, messed up, dysfunctional family, and he prayed to the gods of the Romans and the gods and so forth and said, make me rich. I want to be a wealthy man. And legend says that they answered his prayers and everything that Midas touched Everything that he came across turned into gold. You've heard of the Midas touch before? He would touch his golden cup to drink his tea from, it would turn to gold. He would touch, you know, coins and stuff, they would turn to gold. He would touch wooden chairs, they would turn to gold. He even touched his daughter, and she turned to gold. So then he got upset, and it became a curse. And he prayed, oh, gods, all the gods, please take this curse from me, remove it. And they told him to go wash into the Potomac River, that river that flowed right on the side of the mountain where the church of Sardis was established. And when he washed, he was freed from this curse and the gold fell off of his body and his touch, his golden touch, drained in the rivers. And they say that's why that river that flowed on the side of that mountain had all of that gold in it. Now that's what legend says, but it, it was a fact that gold was surrounded by that river. Even to this day, you can go and archaeologists still excavate pieces of gold from that very river there in the city of Sardis. Wow. This city was also noted for the temple of the pagan goddess Sibyl, which, whose worship was similar to that of the pagan goddess Diana or Artemis. If you can remember the goddess Artemis, the fertility god that we talked about in the book of uh, Ephesus, or in the, dealing with the church of Ephesus, the fertility god. Sardis was noted for its fruits, and it produced linen and wool, which was a commodity, commodity there, and it also was a city that sat at the junction of five main roads or connection points. Again, Sardis was a well-fortified city. It had a walled fortress built 1,500 miles above sea level, right on the side of this big, huge mountain. The military garrison was there, so when the enemy would come in, they would come from the valley and retreat to the fortress, which was a walled-in city, and the walls were 15 feet long, and nobody could penetrate those walls. Wow. Now, legend tells us, again, later on in history, they did actually uh, penetrate the wall because one of the servants from the enemy's side was looking from another mountain, and as he saw one of the uh, guards at the top of the fortress, the guard's helmet fell off. 
and he came down to get us to retrieve the helmet so he had to come down and he followed the guard and found out where the actual gate was to enter into the fortress wow. and that's how the enemy was defeated or Sardis was defeated in war at that particular time and uh, it was also known for death because there was a large graveyard full of over 1,000 tombs called the Necropolis. And as a result, uh, many people were buried there and you can see that graveyard at the top of the mountain from different angles and different mountain views or different views of excavation. And it was called the Necropolis. Now this is where Jesus decided to put a church in this illustrious city of Sardis. And he put this church there and he has this letter to this particular church. Now, each church, Jesus always has a commendation, something that, you know, he commends them for. Yeah. And then, you know, he goes on and, and gives them warning and so forth. But this is one of the few churches that don't really have an accommodation. It doesn't have accommodations at all. No praise at all. It's just a total rebuke. Now, we just talked about this church Right here before getting into this church called Sardis, the church of Thyatira was what we just talked about. Now notice the pattern. Ephesus was the church that lost its first love. Yeah. So when you lose your first love, you end up doing like what the uh, church of Smyrna went through is you go through persecution. Yeah. And as a result, then you start to try to get out of this persecution. So you start doing what the church uh, after the church of uh, Smyrna, which was the church of. Somebody help me out. My mind just went blank. Pergamos, thank you, which was the compromising church. Pergamos compromised because of heavy duty persecution. They didn't want any more persecution, so they started compromising. And then it got to the point where they allowed a woman by the name of Jezebel going into the church, you know, the other church of Thyatira. Jezebel, they allowed the spirit of Jezebel to come to the church where they were totally corrupted. So you go from losing your first love to persecution, to compromising, to being totally false or corrupt, to being dead. Because Smyrna was a dead church. Totally dead. And here we are in this particular church of Smyrna. And Jesus has a letter to this church and he's going to deal with the issue right away. He starts off in Revelation 3 verses 1 through 6. And I'm reading it from the New International Version. And it reads, to the angel of the church of Sardis write, these are the words of him who hold the seven spirits of God and the seven stars. I know your deeds. You have a reputation of being alive, but you are dead. Wake up, strengthen what remains, and it is about to die, for I have not found your deeds complete in the sight of my God. Remember, therefore, what you have received and heard, obey it and repent. But if you do not wake up, I will come like a thief and you will not know at what time I will come to you. Yet you have a few people in Sardis who have not soiled or defiled their clothes. They will walk with me dressed in white for they are worthy. He who overcomes will like them be dressed in white garments I will never blot out his name from the book of life, but will acknowledge his name before my father and his angels. He that hath an ear, let him hear what the spirit saith to the churches. Let's go back and look at verse one again. It says these words are to him who holds the seven spirits of God and the seven stars. Please don't be confused as to what God is saying here. God doesn't have seven different spirits. There is only one Holy Spirit. You say, but it's right there, seven spirits of God. How are you going to argue against that? Understand, the word seven, the number seven is a number of completion. It is a number of completion. When it talks about the seven spirits of God, there is one Holy Spirit, and he is totally the completion of God, but he has seven different attributes, if you will. You know, for instance, in Isaiah chapter 11, verses 1 and 2, it says, And there shall come forth a rod out of the stem of Jesse, and a branch shall grow out of his roots. It says, 
Number one, the spirit of the Lord. That's one spirit right there. Shall rest upon him and the spirit of wisdom. That's number two. And understanding. Three, the spirit of counsel. Four, and might. Five, the spirit of knowledge. Six, and the spirit of the fear of the Lord. Seven, shall rest upon him. Each pastor or each angel, each angel needs that because the angels that we talk about in the book of Revelation where he has the seven stars in his hand and he walks amidst the seven golden candlesticks, the seven golden candlesticks are the seven churches. The seven stars are the angels of the churches. Now you know angels with wings don't preach from a pulpit. When you break that word angelos down, it means messenger. That word messenger means the pastor of that church. Now he may get his message from the angel of God that sends it to that individual church, but he still nevertheless has to get the message downloaded from heaven into his spirit in order to minister that message to the congregation. So he is the messenger that they're referring to that and that pastor is. Now, the seven spirits of God are the completion of the Holy Spirit. Again, the spirit of wisdom or the spirit of the Lord, the spirit of wisdom, the spirit of understanding, spirit of counsel, spirit of might, spirit of knowledge, and the spirit of the fear, fear of the Lord. They make the totality of the one and only Holy Spirit. So that number seven is the completion of the Holy Spirit. There's only one Holy Spirit. He is as much equal with God as Jesus is. Because the Bible says in God, in the book of Colossians, it says in Jesus Christ dwells the Godhead. The Godhead happens to be God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Ghost. These three are one. The Bible tells us in 1 John that there are three that bear record in heaven. The Father, the Word, and the Holy Spirit. These three are one. God thought the plan. Jesus bought the plan. But the Holy Ghost wrought the plan. Amen. They work in perfect tandem. You can't confuse the Trinity because they're one. We don't serve or bow down to three different gods. I just had a young lady about a couple of weeks or so ago I was ministering to that was confused because she didn't know who to pray to. God, Jesus, or the Holy Ghost. She said, you know, I hear people say, well, I'm talking, the, I hear people say the Holy Spirit did this and, this and so does that, does that mean God didn't do it but the Holy Spirit did it himself? I said, no, that was God doing it. He did it through the person of the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit is God in spirit form. I always use this analogy, H2O. I learned in school. I used to love science and so forth until I got into physics. I can't, I can't stand math. I got tripped up over a couple of calculations and stuff, and I said, ah, this is boring now. Only because math was involved, because I'm not a good person. I know basic math, but anything beyond that, I don't even, my strong point was science. Put it that way. I remember the elements. You remember the chart, the elements chart, the charts of the elements and so forth. And you know, matter, all forms of matter come in three forms: solid, liquid, and gas. Y'all remember that? You got this one element called H two O. Doesn't matter what you do to it; it stays and it remains in its natural form. One atom, two atoms of hydrogen, one atom, one atom of oxygen. H two. That's two atoms of hydrogen, one atom of oxygen. Put those together, you have water. If you freeze water, you have water in the solid form. Water in its natural state is in the liquid form. But if you put heat under it and boil it, it becomes gas. Any other elements of that element chart, when gas or heat or something, coldness is applied to it, it changes its structure or its form. Not H2O. H2O remains the same in solid, liquid, or gas. Doesn't matter what you do to it. Heat it, burn it, you know, uh, freeze it. It's still going to be H, two atoms of hydrogen, one atom of oxygen. Well, that's the way God, Jesus, and the Holy Spirit are. They are God. God is God. Jesus is like the form of God. That's the water. And the Holy Ghost is like the spirit portion of God. You can't separate them. When you talk about ice cubes, it's still H2O. When you talk about boiling water, it's still H2O. When you talk about that stream of water you see, it's still H2O. God is still God by himself. He's God in Jesus because Jesus, when God thought the plan, he spoke it. Jesus came out because he's the word of God. And Jesus did it through the power of the Holy Spirit who manifested it. The Holy Spirit, Spirit is in the manifestation department. God is the head of, admini uh, of operations. Jesus is in charge of administration, but the Holy Ghost is in charge of manifestation. 
he brings it to pass. You understand how they work in tandem? God said, boom, Jesus came out of his mouth because he's the word. And it says, in the Bible says the Holy Ghost moved upon the face of the deep. Perfect tandem. The Trinity is an operation there. So the Holy Spirit is one spirit with different attributes. So those are the seven spirits of God that it's referring to. And then it goes on to say, uh, the latter part of verse one, I know your deeds, how you have a reputation. You have a reputation of being alive. You've got this reputation of being alive. Everybody who knows you knows you're a rocking church. You've got it going on. Word has spread. The choir is great. Oh, my God, the kids ministry is booming. You know, you got the fellowship ministry and, the, you know, uh, uh, circle so-and-so so ministry over here and this particular ministry over there. Everybody knows about you. You've got this reputation of being an alive church. People come and flock to where action is. You don't believe it? Let a dead town just exist. And if you hear several fire trucks and ambulances, everybody's going to come out the house. Something noise the broad is going to bring people out of the woodwork, even if it's 12 o'clock at midnight. Somebody's going to show up and look out and find out what's going on. Everybody wants to know what's going on because all this commotion is going on. It draws people. And that's when you'll know how many people are there. So listen, a church, just because it has a huge crowd or a huge following, doesn't mean it's a healthy church. Please understand that you don't equate crowds with healthiness. Amen. You just don't do it. Amen. I've been to several churches. My wife and I, before we committed to uh, the church that we committed to, which was Word of Faith, 25 plus years, before we were members of Word of Faith, we were a member of another church for like seven years. And then we left that church because we felt like that, that was our time. You know, so we were on a quest to find the church that God would have for us to attend. We did this for one solid year. We went to several churches in Atlanta for one whole year. Other churches we'll come back to a second or third time to visit. But we were trying to find out where it was God wanted us to be. White churches, black churches didn't matter to me as long as Christians were there. Because we're all one family anyhow. But we went to several churches was about as dead as a doorknob did. I mean, they were booming and choir and music and stuff, but the word of God, the pastor would get up and tell more jokes. I mean, I like it sometimes humor every now and then, but when you, the whole message is funny jokes, I'm like, am I at the comedy club or at church? I didn't know. And then sometimes we go to these churches and they were just all political. Everything was political, political this, political that. You know, okay, I'm there to get my soul revived. We go to another church, everything is, you know, you know, uh, you know, dealing with African Americans and, you know, us as being good people and this and that. And that's wonderful because I'm an African American and proud to be in every regard. But if that's all you're going to teach at this church is, you know, black ego, eccentricism and so forth and all of these different things dealing with us as a black community. Where's Jesus in this? Yeah. Teach me some gospel, man. I want to hear the word of God where I can grow. Other churches can talk about sports. Oh, man, my team. Oh, the pastor up there talking about this and that. I never forget the time I was in Tyler, Texas as a Bible college student at East Texas Bible College. And several of us got in the van as students and went to a particular church. And this church started on time. You know, all the people were there packed out. The music was great. The minister got up there, very charismatic speaker, spoke real wonderful and so forth. And then all of a sudden, it was Super Bowl Sunday. I'll never forget it. His watch went beep, beep, beep. He's up. Not finished with my message, but I had to stop right here. And he let everybody go home because it was the Super Bowl day. So we didn't hear the rest of that message. You had to come back next week to hear part two. He left us hanging because the Super Bowl was on that Sunday. What kind of church is that? You see what I'm saying? So, I mean, all of these things play in mind, but they had the reputation of being a thriving church. They looked good from the outside. Everything looked great from the outside, but they were dead. The word dead comes from a word called necros, which means lifeless, corpse, cadaver, stiff, dead body. It wasn't a metaphor. He meant you're literally dead. You're not like somebody that's dead. You are dead. Jesus said that. Now the world and people in the church, the Christians, thought that they were an alive church, a thriving church. But Jesus himself, coming from him, he is the head of the church. He's the 
the church himself. He's the head. We are the body of Christ. Yeah. The head says you're dead. You're dead. Yeah. What do you do with something that's dead? Yeah. Bury that thing. Get it. You cut it off. Get it out of your midst. Bury it. Or it'll stink. Start to stink and smell. And Jesus said to everybody, to the church of Sardis, everybody knows and thinks you look good and everything, but guess what? Your presence doesn't match up with your reputation. You are dead. Had the, had the mind and the reputation of being alive. You know, but you're dead. Can a dead church still have members? Can a dead church still have a rocking choir? Can a dead church still have people joining? And you can still be there. Believe it or not, uh, it's absolutely possible for you to have outstanding musicians, a thriving ministry, wonderful, you know, e you know, uh, energetic membership, and still be totally dead in the sight of God. Doing seemingly the right things, but talking about all the wrong things. Did you realize that the human body, after you're dead for hours, even in the morgue, it's been proven that nails still grow and hair follicles still grow after the body's been dead. These are areas of your body that, lead, that need the least amount of oxygen. So the oxygen that is deprived, your body has been deprived of, the cells didn't get the memo yet. They're still growing in those certain areas until after a period of so, so many hours. Then eventually they die off. But that body is dead even though there's still growth. It's dead. It's as though you take a branch from a tree and this branch is a beautiful branch full of green leaves that look very healthy but then all of a sudden lightning strikes the tree and the branch falls off the tree somewhere. Guess what? That tree for a week or two or even three still looks healthy. The leaves are still green. It still looks crispy. It still looks healthy but it's dead because it's not connected to the trunk of the tree which is the source of its life. It has been lopped off, cut off, and is dead. Totally dead. But yet that tree didn't get that memo. It thought it was still alive. Jesus said in St. John chapter 15 verses 4 and 5, Abide in me and I in you as the branch cannot bear fruit of itself unless it abides in the vine. Neither can you unless you abide in me. I am the vine, you are the branches. He who abides in me and I in him, you know, bears much fruit. For without me, you can do nothing. Yes. Churches are, are sometimes operating on what I call autopilot. Yes. They have a minister that has been preaching for so many years that he can just preach sermons on autopilot. He doesn't even have to spend time with the Lord in his mind. To get his messages. He's been preaching and knows all the little lingo. He knows all the phrases. Got the certain scriptures and so forth. He could just on, on autopilot at any moment. Just at the drop of a hat. Start speaking and boom. Those words seem to connect. And people get you know, goosebumps. And all of this starts to go on. And they get all excited. And you know, get all turned on and stuff. Because of the way the man, man of God preaches. And sometimes we like those feel good kind of messages. Because to be perfectly honest. Every now and then. You need a feel-good message that will snap you out of that liturgy, lethargy, you know, that spiritual liturgy or, 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 or burdens or, you know, depression that tries to come. You need something to break that every now and then. Sometimes you need a shouting kind of message, but then other times you need one of those quiet messages where you sit and listen. And all you need is the teaching so you can change and be a better person. But, but, but just because of the eloquence and because of the char char charisma that this person has doesn't mean that Jesus Christ's stamp of approval is upon that church. There are several things that have to make it qualify for that to happen. I can't forget the time when my family, before we, uh, once we got saved, my sister was the first one in our family to give her heart to Jesus. She used to work at the post office. And one of her bosses on, at, at the post office ministered to her about Christ. She came home. My mom and our family, we were involved in heavy-duty witchcraft. My mother played with the Ouija board. We'd go to tarot card readers. I would be there with her. She'd pay money to get her palms read at these little places. We went to all kind of Roman candles, money candles, where they were all over the house burning and stuff. Incense unto the gods or whatever you want to call it. And we were all into this witchcraft stuff, really heavy. And my sister came in talking about Jesus Christ. 
and all of this. And next thing you know, my mother just had an ur urgency to want to know more about Jesus. So we went to a church one day, and this particular church, it was, uh, it was in College Park, all-white congregation church. We were the only black family in that whole church. But let me tell you something. These people had more love than I could shake a stick at. They, loved, they, knew, they knew how to love on folks. We felt welcome. We felt the love of Jesus. Man, we had such a wonderful time. Listen, I had more fun in my teenage years when I attended that church than any other time of my entire teenage life. Listen, we would go out and play baseball on Sundays after service, and we had the best baseball time playing baseballs, and after we played baseball, we would eat watermelon, and you know, a lot of white people can have some show enough fun, y'all. They do some crazy stuff from the black perspective. Crazy stuff, but I got mixed up in it and got involved in it, and I had myself the best time. We would eat the watermelon, and after you ate the rhyme, you take the rhyme and squash it in somebody's face. Who wants all them germs on them? But guess what? It was fun! We would go out and, man, we had the best. I'm telling you, I would look forward to going to church so we could play baseball if the sun allowed. Yeah. And we would go out there. We had the best time. We would wrestle. We had wrestling mats in the church where we could wrestle and stuff with these mats. We were wrestling each other and all of the stuff. And then they had a comedy night where people would tell jokes. We were cracking up, and we had a female preacher who was preaching. But, she, but I learned later, she wasn't preaching the word of God. I had the best time of my life. But I know that salvation wasn't being preached. Healing, deliverance wasn't being preached. The second coming of Jesus wasn't being preached. None of these things were being preached. But yet I had the best time of my life. The church was dead. Yeah. But to me, you could not convince me to save my life that that church was dead. That was the best thing going on since sliced bread in my mind. Everything was right. I was happy for the first time in my life. Really happy, enjoying myself. But guess what? It was a feel-good church. But the pastor was into some stuff that she shouldn't have been into. One of her main deacons, brother so-and-so, everybody knew him, was over here shacking with one of the sisters in the church while he's married. Listen to this. There were, she, had two, she had twin daughters. Both of their names began with the letter J. I don't want to say it <laughs> openly, but... One of the daughters, husband, worked at Delta Airlines as a administrative. He was in an administrative position. He had a six-figure income, and he ended up with uh, multiple sclerosis, MS. And he, we started to see him deteriorate and go downhill, and he would come in with a cane, and from cane to wheelchair, from wheelchair to, you know, people, people having to pull him around. He couldn't do anything, and he wanted his wife to remarry when he died. She said, are you sure, honey? Yeah, yeah, I want you to go on with your life. So she met a boyfriend while he was still alive and bought, brought the boyfriend to church. And the husband would be in a wheelchair on the end of the pew while she's next to her boyfriend, while he's still living. And he seemed to be okay with that. I'll never forget that. And when he died, this guy just, the next couple of days, they went on and had gotten married. I mean, this, this blew my mind. Even as a teenager, I knew that wasn't right. This is the kind of stuff that was going on in this church. It was dead. But it was so, it, it, it broke my heart because I, I wanted to stay. And my mother said, it's time to go. I'm like, no, no, no more baseball. No, no more water going to fight. No, we got we to gotta stay. But I had the best fun. But I wasn't growing at all. I was dying and didn't even know I was in a dead church. Jesus was with the disciples and he physically cursed a fig tree. And when he cursed this particular fig tree, the disciples were scratching their head because they looked at the tree and the tree had leaves on it. Everything was healthy, beautiful green leaves. But guess what? Something was missing. The figs were missing. The tree was born or made for one purpose, produce figs. Figs are supposed to be on it. But this one wasn't growing the figs. So Jesus cursed it. Why? There was no fruit. There were leaves, but no fruit. It was alive, but it didn't do what it was intended to do. Grow fruit. Where are the fruit in the church? Where is the passion in the church? Where is the Holy Ghost anointing in the church? If you don't have these different ingredients, you don't have a 
thriving life church. I don't care how much fun you have. I don't care how much music you have. I don't care how much of a rocking choir you have. I don't care how much of a powerful youth ministry you have. If there is no leading of the Holy Spirit and the Holy Spirit, if he's not in charge, the church is dead as a doorknob. Dead. Twice dead, plucked up by the roots. You gotta have the right ingredients for the church to be there. Jesus has got to be on the throne. The message has got to be fresh from heaven, from God. To know where you live at and to speak it to your heart. Or else you just have the motion. You just have the motions of going to church. Feeling good because everybody's in there. You got your favorite little group of people you like to hang around and talk to. And go out to eat afterwards. It doesn't mean the church is growing. I pray for a healthy church. God knows I, I put myself on the altar God and pray for a healthy church. At one time we were pulling in numbers here almost close to 100. Y'all remember those days? Had powerful musicians, good drummers, and keyboardists. Y'all remember those days? All of a sudden, you now we just, this is just our fourth year in operation here. Just still a new church. Then every, everything disappeared. I'm like, what in the world? Lord, are we cursed? What's going on? God said, You're not cursed, you're blessed. Amen. Many people can't stand what you're preaching. Come on now. Some were here for the wrong motives. It was a new church. They wanted to thrive. They wanted their ministry to be entangled with our ministry. And they wanted me to get pushed to the side so they could always be behind the pulpit preaching. That's not how you grow a church. You know, everybody has a gift. Everybody has something God wants for them to do. But, but the, you never start off on top of anything in life. You always have to go through a process. Everything in life is a process. You start from the beginning and you get to the point where you end up on top. The only uh, position you start off on top, you've heard this before, is when you're digging a hole and it's downhill from there. You never start off on top. You always go through. There's a waiting period. Even though you got the anointing of God, everybody who knows you knows that you're anointed. But until God opens that final door for your time to come, you better sit there and take in as much as you can. Because you're still in the oven baking and you're not quite good. You finish it. You look good, but when you take the cake out, it sinks. Because it wasn't quite ready. You put a toothpick in there and you got all this gooey stuff coming out. Because it's not quite cooked. It looks ready, but it's not. And only God knows the heart. And he knows the timing. Don't think you're too late. You're right on time when you're in the flow of God's spirit. Many people look alive on the outside. They look healthy. They look vibrant. But on the inside, they're lost. They're miserable, confused, low self-esteem, walk in negativity, have serious self-image complex about themselves, walking in their physical body, but they've mentally checked out. Because it don't seem like there's any hope for them anymore. And it's an indictment on heaven because we call ourselves uh, children of God. And for us to say we're children of God and not produce fruit is a slap in God's face. People want to know if you represent Jesus, you should act like Jesus, walk like Jesus, talk like Jesus. There should be some residue of Christ in you because you've been in his presence. But when you come to a person that's dead and they smell like smoke, they smell like, instead of smelling like the fragrance of God's presence, something's wrong with that picture. They've got the name of Christian on them. Yet they're dead as this church of Sardis was dead. How then does Jesus define a dead church versus our definition of a dead church or vice versa? Let me give you this quick scenario. I was at an auction one day and I was buying a car for a young man. And this is one of the reasons why I don't have anybody go to the auction with me, even though right now because of the virus, all the auctions have been closed lately. But this particular gentleman wanted me to buy him a car and I allowed him to go to a dealer's auction with me. And now they've stopped that because so many people would come in and bring family members and relatives and pile it up and all the dealers were upset with that because these outsiders who weren't, weren't dealers were buying all the stuff up and this is a dealer's auction. So dealers complained about it, so they stopped it. But at this time, you were able to let somebody go in there with you. So I was in there so the young man could pick out the kind of car he wanted. And I came there earlier that day and I, he told me what kind of car he wanted. I checked out all the cars he wanted. I had my OB2 connector, which is that little computer you put put to the OB2 connector to see if there are any codes on that car so you can know what you're getting into before you buy this car. Then you test drive the car in the parking lot area to see if there's any smoke and all this knocking in the engine. You know, you got to go down the checklist as a car dealer to know what you're getting involved in. 
So I was trying to ensure and, and, and make it, you know, to where this guy would get one of the best cars for the amount of money that he had. And I told him, I said, now, you don't just get all enamored over the way the car looks on the outside. You want to make sure that that engine is strong, that transmission is not slipping. It's got a good solid transmission. Don't worry about the little cosmetic stuff that's easy to fix, like stuff like brakes and all that. You can always fix that. But the window don't work. This window, this car is raggedy. Car may be in great shape, but just because the window's not working doesn't make it raggedy. It just needs a new window regulated. You don't go throwing a car and kicking it to the curb because the window can't roll up. That's simple. Now, major issues are AC compressor. You know, engine problems. You know, head problems on the engine. All this kind of stuff. Those are major things. They call them major costs. Transmission. Yeah. So I told him, be there with me, but don't just go crazy over it. And so then he saw this particular car go through. It had the nice little 20, 20 inch rims, and it was all sparkly, shiny, and chrome, and a brand spanking new paint job on it. And that car was looking so good. He, ended, he looked up the inside, had some, he opened the inside of the door, had this good and clean car smell to it because somebody put some car uh, deodorant in there for the cars or whatever and everything looked wonderful. Engine was all shiny, but he didn't know I checked that car out earlier that day. That car would have failed any inspection. Had over three codes and many of them were transmission codes, catalytic converter code, a uh, bank something, one of the, uh, on banks one or bank two, one of the, the flow or something was messed up. That car would have flunked. And, and, and you don't want to touch that, but it looked good on the outside. That's why it was a red light car, yeah. as is. It wasn't a green light. It was sold as a red light. That's a red flag right there. Yeah. I said, you don't want a car like that. Oh, this is exactly what I want. I said, you don't want a car like that. No, this is what I want. I said, you don't want that car. Why not? Because I checked it out. That car won't even make it home. He, he, he listened to me, so he had his hands in his pocket. So I went on and went on, you know, inside the auction and everything was going on. He was sitting there all just enamored by all these cars. He didn't, he, his mouth fell open. He didn't even believe how cheap these cars were. Because yeah, we did it at a wholesale cost. Dealers do. Then they put the retail cost on it. We can get a $2,700 car and turn around and sell it to the public for $5,500. The car's got low miles on it the whole night. But we just bought it at the auction for $2,700, maybe $3,000. Turn around and sell it for $4,500. Or 5000 or whatever. And, I mean, you know, so he didn't understand this process. But I had to go inside for something. I said, don't do anything until I come back. <laughs> now, that car that he wanted came through. Oh. The dealers were around the car looking at it, and not anybody bid it on it. <laughs> and that ought to tell you something. Right. This car, see those dealers are smart. We do our homework. Yeah. We do our due diligence before we bid on stuff. Nobody bid it on it. A couple of bids, but... It was so low they didn't want to go with that, those bids. So he was like, man, that car didn't even sell. I said, that's, I said, there's a reason. I said, you don't want to mess with that one. I let him know. I checked it out. I said, I thought it was cool looking the way it looked, but don't mess with it. Went inside, came out, and he was smiling and grinning and going on. And he went even around the cars, and I was trying to find, where is he? And he was going, heading toward the parking lot. I said, DeAndre, where are you going, man? He stopped and said, hey, man, bless you. Woo. I said, where are you going? I just bought one. What? You bought what? I bought a car. I said, what do, you, what do you mean you bought a car? I'm the dealer. How did you buy a car? He said, what's the badge number when I raised my hand? Because I wanted to be it. And he said, I just gave you the four numbers on your badge. Oh. I said, you did what? It wasn't five minutes. I promise you, no more than five minutes. And I said, what car did you buy? The very car I told him not to buy. It went through, nobody bid it on it, so they sent it through a second time. When they sent it through the second time, they put two cones on top of the car, which lets the dealer know it's been through once before. And it had the two cones on top because I didn't know it was coming back through, and he bid it on the car and won the bid. I wanted to say in my flesh, you idiot, but you know, I'm a man of God, I didn't say that. I said, but why would you do that? He said, well, man, it was looking good. I said, I told you, don't bid on that car. I said, well, you got to pay for it now. So he gave me his money. We went in, did the paperwork, paid for it. But the title wasn't in. By law, you have 21 days for the seller to turn in that title to the auction. If after the 21st day that title hadn't been turned in, you as the uh, dealer can get out of the car if you like. 
So the, the title wasn't there, but I knew the title would be there in a couple of days. And now this guy is stuck with this car. So I said, well, all right, then I said, if that's what you wanted. I said, look, but I told you not to. I said, I begged you not to. I said, you didn't listen to me. I said, you're going to have to pump a lot of money into that thing. I said, because guess what? What? I said, your car has to pass emissions. I said, by law, as a dealer, I can't even sell you the car until it passes emissions. I said, so that means you've got to spend money out of your pocket. And it could be over $2,000 because you got four major codes. It could even be 3000 I said, you got four. He said, really? I said, I told you this up front. But man, that, that should be that hard to fix. I said, well, regardless, it's your money. You're going to have to be the one to fix it. Because this is what you purchased. Well, on his way home, the car broke down. He calls me up on the cell phone. And I, had, I go and pick him up, and we call a buddy of mine who had a tow truck and came and towed the truck and took it from that spot to his house and charged him $95 because the car was dead. It looked alive. It looked beautiful. It looked vibrant. Everybody who would see that car would be brushing up to look at it because it had the new paint job and shiny mag wheel rims clean on the inside. All that was a facade because it was rotting away on the inside. Dead, and he bought it, and he was crying. A grown man was crying about my car, you know, because the car broke down. And I, and, and I wanted to say, "What did you do?" I, I wanted to just rub it in and say, "Why did you do that? You're not a dealer. I am. Why would you do that when I told you not to do this?" And as a result, he had to live with that car. I felt sorry for him, so I would go over his house and we would touch and agree and pray and ask the Lord for a miracle. I said, God, give this brother a miracle. Give him a miracle, Father. I said, he did something foolish, but he did it out of ignorance. He didn't know any better. I said, God, touch his heart. Give him a miracle. Reverse the situation. After 21 days, the title didn't come in. I took the car back to the auction and got his money back. This time he said, Reverend Blackshear, you buy the car for me. <laughs> you see how that works? God was on his side. God was on his his side. The Bible says in 1 Samuel 16, 7, for man looketh on outward appearance. He looks at what he sees is wonderful, but God looks at the heart. That's why the Lord says in Isaiah chapter 55, verse 8, my ways are not your ways, your thoughts are not my thoughts. As high as the heavens are from the earth, so are my ways than your ways, and so are my thoughts than your thoughts. God's thoughts and ways are past finding out. Amen? Amen. Listen to this right quick. I want to give you real quick Signs of a dead or dying church. Signs of a dead or dying church. This church, Sardis, was a dead church. Mm -hmm. Number one, there are no functional prayer or praise gatherings. There's no intercessory ministry. Thank God, as small of a church as we may have, we have an intercessory ministry praying for this church. Amen. I wouldn't be satisfied if we didn't. That church, listen, the intercessory ministry, those of you that are part of the intercessory ministry, lift your hands up real quick and wave them, wave them. Yeah. Yeah. Amen. These are intercessors. Okay, look, look, look around. I want to make sure y'all intercessors look around at these hands. Are they on the phone every Tuesday? I don't want no lies in here. <laughs> they may be waving their hands, didn't get on the ministry prayer line. Two, you were there three months ago and waving your hand. You don't even count if you're not consistent. I just want to make sure. Listen, thank God. Let's give a hand to our intercessors. They get things done. They pray for the church. Listen, the sign of a dying church, you don't have an intercessor prayer ministry. And if you don't have, do, do you realize prayer is the backbone of a ministry? And if prayers are not going out, how do you think the ministry can be successful? Prayers are the thing that keeps this thing going. Then number two, there is no expectation for answered prayers. No expectation for answered prayers at all. People just pray out of need. They pray out of emotions. And they don't even believe that the prayer they prayed is going to work. They don't believe God can heal a family member that's sick. They don't believe God can give somebody a job that hadn't had a job for four or five years. They don't believe God can do this. You, you, when you tell them that, they like to hear the hope that you give them. And they're, they're smiling because they like that thing called hope. But they really don't believe it. If you don't believe it, look at the book of Acts chapter 12 where they were praying for Peter who was locked up in prison. The church, the Bible says, was praying for Peter. Oh God, in the name of Jesus, please release our leader Peter. Oh God, we need him. You said that upon him, Peter, the 
rock. You would build your church. Oh, God, we need him. Souls are being saved by him. His ministry, his love, his compassion. Oh, God, we need our leader. Bring him out of these bounds of bondage of uh, prison, Lord, and let the shepherds fall off and all this stuff fall off. And God was listening to the saints' prayers and doing just that. He had it where an angel came and took Peter out of his situation, put the guards to sleep, went, walked right past all the guards, opened the gate of the prison, and Peter was set free, came to the door, knocking on the door, Rhoda opened the door and went, wow, I can't believe this, told the, the gang, praying, hey, guys, stop your prayers, God has heard us, Peter is at the door. The saint's response was, you must be mad. It must be his ghost. <laughs> what you praying for, church? Peter's release. God heard your prayer. Peter's at the door. Your answer awaits you at the door. That must be his ghost. <laughs> Don't even believe what they're praying is going to come to pass. What's the sense of praying? That's the sign of a dead church. No saints. Listen. Let me say this real quick. I hope I have time. Uh, I got a few minutes left, but can y'all give me another few few minutes? I want to make sure I get this one preached here today. We get you out of here before one o'clock. I promise you. We, I promise. I, I give you a promise. You will be out of here before one o'clock a.m. A.m. I promise you. In Jesus' name, I promise you. You'll be out of here before one o'clock a.m. All right. <laughs> Some of y'all say, "Yeah, you can preach all you want to, but when I get tired, I'm getting out of this place." Well, all right. <laughs> you give that preaching by yourself. <laughs> all right. There are no, there's, there's no expectation of prayers to be answered. Now, let me say this. Remember, these churches were literal churches. They were literal churches during the time of uh, Paul, uh, I mean, uh, John, uh, because he established them and he wrote the book of Revelation in 95 AD. So before the book of Revelation was even written, the church was already in existence. And Jesus Christ gave letters to John to give to the churches. Because when John became an old man, they exiled him on this island. And it, was no, and it had no fruit or vegetation, no means of escape. They had uh, guards there to protect him. And, and John was in a cave in the mountain on, on Patmos when he wrote Revelation. And so the Bible says that these things must shortly come to pass. Shortly, meaning that the church at that present time was going through major, major persecution. They need some words of comfort then. But then it extends all the way up into our present day age because these seven churches are also the spiritual annotation of the seven eras that the churches will go through. What went through these seven churches were actually what we're going through literally right now. To the T. When one church was dead, the existence of that church for years spanned and during that period of time, it was a dead period of time. Because that dead church, when corruption hit, it was corruption going through this church for that many years. It literally represented the seven eras that the churches would go through. There were more churches that Jesus Christ established besides those seven churches. There was the church of Jerusalem, the church of Rome, the church of uh, Colossia. Those are not mentioned in Revelation. But these were specific churches that Jesus had special keys for that were key positions. They were on what they called the postal route of Turkey. They, those churches were like in a, like almost a horseshoe shape. You got Ephesus here, Smyrna here, you know, per, per, Pergamon here, uh, Thyatira here, Sardis here, and then come down a little bit right here, Philadelphia, and then they ought to see it down here. It was like almost a circle, a complete circle, but not quite, it looked, it looked like the letter C almost. It was like a postal route. And, and they were in Asia Minor, which is today considered to be Eastern Turkey. That's where these cities still remain to, to this very day. Now, during this particular period of time, uh, the apostolic church, the, the first church that was there was the church of Ephesus. That, that's mentioned in Revelation. It existed between A.D. 30 and died off pretty much when Titus came in and desecrated the temple and leveled Jerusalem, A.D. 70. That's when it stopped, AD 70, right during that period of time. That's when persecution started from saints, Christians that were carrying the gospel of Jesus Christ. They were being persecuted like you wouldn't believe. And Jesus told the church of Smyrna that you're all going to be, you know, going through a serious, serious series of persecutions. He said, for 10 days, 
you're going to be persecuted. Those days are to be literally interpreted as ten waves of different emperors that would be raised up. There were exactly ten emperors that hated Christians and killed more Christians during that time than the entire history of the church itself. That's when Fox's Book of Martyrs was written during those times of heavy duty persecution. Christians, Nero, would take bodies of Christians and burn them on stakes alive and that bodies, dead bodies of these Christians would light the city when you would come to his kingdom and dead bodies would be on stakes burning and he thought it was funny. They would feed uh, Christians to lions and so forth in the arena and people would sit there and, and like sports and they, this would be entertainment as Christians' bodies are being mutilated by these wild beasts. And stones, big heavy duty stones were put on the body of Christians and crushed. And they were stoned by people throwing rocks at them, sun or sun. The bodies were split up and sun in half. They would do what they call flaying. Flaying was when you would boil a person's body and keep them alive and then peel their skin off while they're still living. They would feel the pain of this. Christians went through hell. Persecution during the time of Smyrna. The church of Smyrna went through that, which was between AD 70 and 313. A.D. 313 A.D. From A.D. 70 to 313, listen to this. In 313 or in 312, there was this particular emperor when God said enough is enough because the tenth, after the tenth emperor did all his due diligence as far as killing the Christians and persecuting them, God raised up an emperor. And, and his name happened to be Constantine. In, in, in 312, and Constantine said this. We're going to put a stop to this nonsense. He had a vision from heaven, and he saw a vision of a cross with a sword, the end of a sword that shapes like the letter P. You know, like when you take your hand on a sword, you got that little part that, at the end, that little part like that, you put your hand on, it shapes like a P. It was like a P that went through a cross. That was a symbol or emblem. And God says, if you use this in your battle, you will win. So he made up these emblems that look like a cross and that letter P, and he won. And he gave his heart to Jesus Christ and submitted unto Christ. Now, he was from Rome. Rome, the Roman Empire, they had a major turn at the turn of the century in the 400 uh, AD period, the, the, right in the turn of the century, the late 400 AD period or the early 500s, the Roman Empire died out. But when Constantine was the leader of Rome, and remember, all the persecution came from Roman emperors. Once he became a Christian, he turned around and wrote this thing called the Edict of Milan, which meant that the state is now going to adopt Christianity as its number one religion. These are the Romans that hated the Christians, that killed the Christians. The Roman church took Christianity upon itself and adopted it. The paganistic teachings of the Romans intermingled with Christians and you have the birth of the Roman Catholic Church during that period of time. Now listen to this. That lasted for 1,000 years from 500 AD all the way to 1,500, 1,500 AD. That's 1,000 years. 1,000 years, the reign of the Catholic Church, which was a church that was full of corruption because Thyatira, during the church period of Thyatira, where that woman Jezebel was on in, in that church, in, in, in the natural sense, during a 1,000 year period, the Catholic Church was in full operation. Listen to this, y'all. This is going to be mind-boggling. Are y'all ready for this? Yeah. During this 1,000, somebody say 1,000 years. years. Listen, listen. Do you know that America, this is controversial somewhat, you know, but it was discovered by, they say by Christopher Columbus, but of course we know that there were Indians here first. Yeah. He discovered that other people were here. But he gets the credit because in 1492, Christopher Columbus so-called discovered America during that period of time. That seems like a long, long time ago, doesn't it? 1492. Now imagine. Think about it. 1492. Do you know how many years that was? This is going to be mind-boggling. That wasn't but 529 years ago. I know 529 years is still long, but you would think that's over 1,000 years. It was only 529 years ago. Now imagine this. That's one set of years, 529. Add another 500 to that. Mm -hmm. Then another 500. That's 1,500 years. Because you had five, you had 1,000 years of, of, of the Catholic Church reign, and then you had the Reformation period, which was another 300 years. And that's 1,300 years of boredom in 
church. One church is in charge. The Catholic Church. Roman Catholic. This is not an indictment on anybody that's a Roman Catholic. I'm not trying to say your religion is false, but the Bible says it for me. <laughs> I didn't. But I'm just letting you know it's intermingled with paganism and idolatry. And it introduces the doctrine of purgatory and all of this kind of stuff. And listen to this. During this period of time, listen, no church traditionally had a band or praise music. You only had pipe organ music. Listen, no teaching of the second coming of Christ or eschatology was in the church. No teaching of the conversion of souls through Jesus Christ. No altar calls were given. No evidence of the operation of the gifts of the spirit in any way, any shape, or in any form. No testimonies of miracles or of signs and wonders were done for over a thousand years. No teaching of the power of satanic forces through the blood of Jesus were taught. No Holy Spirit baptism, no evidence of speaking in tongues were taught at all. No altar calls, you know, no praying for the sick. The only ones that would cast out devils here and there were ministers or priests, which would do it with holy water, and it would be in different intervals. But that was it. None of that I just mentioned took place. And can you imagine going to church every Sunday like that for thousands of years? Not 500, not, not a thousand years, but actually 1,300 years of nothing. 1,300 years, all those generations of people didn't know who Jesus really was because the only one that had this was the Catholic Church. And they set up a kingdom sort of like a heaven on earth and the Pope was like God on earth. And the Papal, it was called the Papalus or the Papal. That's when you had the, you know, monetaries and so forth and you had the monks and the nuns and the fathers who were the priests and all of this kind of stuff. You had a heavenly system set up on planet earth because of the paganistic beliefs intertwined, mixed in with Christianity, which God hates because that's a form of what? The doctrine of the what? Nicolaitans. Mixture, mixture of idolatry with Christianity. It's pure Christianity. Nothing is to be mixed with it. But when you mix it, you've just tainted it. You've polluted it. You've diluted it. The efficacy of it has been lost. The power has been gone. You've mixed it. And as a result, you have this church birth. So through all of those years, all of this stuff was going on and nothing was there except for when the uh, Reformation period took place, which was a Catholic monk by the name of Martin Luther got sick and tired of this stuff. He got a hold of the Latin lettering because nobody could read the Bible but the priest because it was written in Latin. And when this man understood Latin and he read the Bible for the first time, he said, woe is us. We're off base big time. We've seen and he took this thing called the 95 Thesis and he tapped it on the door of uh, 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 the German church, which was the Catholic church. He tapped it on that door. And these are 95 complaints he had against the uh, Catholic religion and the Reformation was born. And this new religion or this new belief, a denomination called Protestants, Protestants, Protestants was birthed. Protestants came and they broke away from the Catholic Church and they said we're going to do it the way of the Bible and not, not the way of this church because they've tainted everything. So now you have to a split in the church and from that you have reformation that took place you have the Protestant faith and he, he is Martin Luther then you have the Lutheran church that was burned, uh, that was birthed and then Calvin, he met a guy by the name of John Calvin and the Calvin, Calvinistic doctrine was preached and the Methodist church was there, you had done denominations that broke down and broke through and all of this it came all out of the Catholic church because all that was messed up and you go all the way back past that backwards to the original church in the book of Acts chapter 2, that's the church that had the tongues the gifts, the fire, the power of God everything and it got tainted and lost in the shuffle. But Jesus promised, upon this rock, I'm going to build my church. It may go through 13 years of pure boredom and hell, so to speak, where nothing seems to matter or wane. But listen, my spirit is going to come on people and I'm going to revive this thing. And the church really didn't take off as we know it to 1906 when the Azusa Street Church was born and the Pentecostal movement broke out. And people start speaking in tongues, black, white, Asian, you know, African, Jew, uh, Indian, from all over the world. They would come to 19, uh, 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 what is it, uh, 906 Azusa Street in Los Angeles, California. 
and be taught the word of God and end up speaking in tongues. And then that broke another era of the church, which is the Philadelphia church that we're getting into next week. Well, I don't know if I'll be able to finish this or not this week. But let me just say this. The reason why the church was dying is because, number two, they didn't believe in their prayers. I said all that to say that. <laughs> number three, and I'll end with this one. The presence of God is missing in the assembly of the saints. Politics is preached. Libertarianism is preached. Sports and all this kind of stuff is preached. And Jesus promised us that when two or three are gathered together in his name, there he will be right there in the midst of them. Listen to this. God spoke to me this week. And I'm jumping the gun here, but I got I, I to gotta just give you this little nugget because I want you to come back next week. He, from heaven, spoke to me and gave me something and told me that Christians today that go under the name of Christian, many of them are literally dead. And we have the title of Christian. People look at us and they know us to be Christians by our reputation. But what we're doing is not pleasing to God. We are walking dead individuals and don't even know it. He gave me one word and broke it down, a simple word, and revelation came out of it. I want to share that with you next week. I want to do it right now so badly, but if I do, then you may not come back next week. <laughs> you got to get them when you can. I want you to come back for part two of this next week. We're going to finish up on this dead church sadness. Was there any hope in this church? Of course there was, or else Jesus would not have written a letter if they were totally doomed. There were a few people whose linen cloths, the Bible says, were not marred or, or, or dirty, but they did keep the teachings of the original word of God in them. And he said, for their sake, wake up and save and savage what you can, because if you're not watchful, when I come, I'm going to come to you like a thief. I am not a thief, but I will come to you as a thief and snatch things away from you so quick you won't even know what happened and you will be dead forever. So he gave them hope because he wouldn't build that church and let it just go to, to pieces if there was no hope. Somebody shout hallelujah. Hallelujah. Amen. Let's all stand up right now. Let's give God some praise. Church of Sardis. This is just, listen. Listen. We got six more things to talk about, and then we're going to talk about the signs of a dead, dying Christian. That's why I want to share that revelation right there. And then we're going to end this thing on a high note. Amen. So please come back for the conclusion of this on next Sunday. Rain or shine, be back next Sunday. Amen. Amen. Let's go before the Lord in prayer. Father, we thank you so very much, Lord, for coming in our midst, Lord, to speak to our hearts, to share this word with us, Lord, to Remind us of the fact that God, just because we look the part, doesn't necessarily mean we have the goods. Amen. Father, let our testimony of Jesus that we talk about line up with our walk, yes. our actions, our attitude, yes. and the way we treat others. Yes. Let it be that when people bump into us, they bump into Jesus. Yes. Because we are Christians, Christ ones. Yes. We are anointed ones of God. Lord, we are the disciples of Jesus Christ. Yes. We are kingdom men and women of God. We're in this world, but we're not of it. God, we're simply passing through to send a message of hope in the midst of darkness and gloom around us. You said to let our lights so shine among men that they will see our good works and then turn around and glorify the Father which is in heaven. Speak, Holy Spirit, to us this week as we drive, as we go home, as we go to work. Lord, minister to our hearts so that we can get closer to you than ever before. Put it in us, Lord, to hold on and hang in there without a doubt and to know that the best days of us are ahead. Even in the midst of all of what society will go through, you will keep us shielded even as you did the children of Goshen and protect us. Thank you for your Holy Spirit breathing upon us. Lord, as we depart and go our separate ways, let your grace, your mercy, and your favor go with us until we meet again. We ask these blessings and prayers in Jesus' awesome name. Amen. God bless you guys. Thank you so much for coming. You all have a wonderful week. Don't forget, stop by the table over here on the